Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the SoFi Weekly. Three months ago, had a little bet uh, between us uh, in a Christmas gift exchange, if you recall. Do you, do you remember that, Tevis? <laughs> you know <where> I'm <laughs> With Tanner? All right. So we did the gift exchange, if you remember. And so Stephen and I ended up exchanging. I personally am still hopeful. I'm hoping Stephen wins because uh, yeah, he got me SoFi. And uh, at 977 is when I bought those uh, shares. And uh down a little bit, uh, you know, and, and part of that, of course, short interest Robin Hood. We're going to talk about that, too. Anything can happen between the, now and the end. Uh, like these stocks, they, they can actually move wildly. So this is not all the way over. Just something fun to pop in there, especially with Unity down that much, Tevis. I hope that in at the six month mark, if you're not winning, that you still post the results regardless. I have one other th of this type of post that's saved. And it's the, of course, the Tevis bet uh, on when he sold. A certain stock. Do you do you remember the stock you sold and bought more SoFi? I would it's still funny. make the trade. That's the thing. I would still make the trade. I don't. I've I, I stand I've sold that. out of uh, Palantir. Jesse Dow has sold out of Palantir. Tevis sold out of Palantir. Who gets the hate? Tevis. <laughs> Dude, Chris went short Palantir, and I think he got way less hate. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> SoFi is not. Uh, it, it surprised me just how weak the stock has been this year. Um, how high that short interest is. Um, anything can happen in short term. It's not always rational, um, like that short interest for SoFi. These things have moved so aggressively in such a short period of time. It's scary even at this snapshot to make a call for the year because there's going to be so many macro events that we have coming up towards the end of the year as well with our first rate cuts, presidential election around the corner. Who knows what might happen just because something is up like a hundred percent in the first month of the year doesn't mean that it's going to end the year up a hundred percent. It could end it up the year 200%, but it could also not like a year is a long time. When you think about it last year at this time, so if I was at $4 and it went to $12, like in a matter of two weeks, and that's like a three X just that move alone. You know, if we'd made that bet last year, it's like I would have wanted to bet because that was the idea with the pound here bet because so if I, let's say if it went from four to 12, that's a three X. Palantir would have to then go to like 50. And so that's like so much more difficult to achieve because of the market cap. At least that was the idea. My point that I'm trying to make is these things can move up or down in a hurry. And so you never really know when you're calling something out 12 months. There absolutely could be a very short stretch of time, depending on the catalyst, depending on what's happening in the macro, where SoFi moves up very, very violently. It could move down violently too, but we're already at a point where I think that that becomes less and less likely. So like trying to compress something further and further, and the more you compress, the harder it gets. So we'll have to see. I still think Robinhood will win just because it has that colossal lead and all the catalysts this year. I think it'll be a more interesting race than it is right now, for sure. I don't think it's going to be a blowout. Look, I think there's such a huge recency bias. What I've been seeing with SoFi ever since they did the convertible note offering at the beginning of March the stock's been so flat. Like this week alone, it closed literally 7.30. It opened 7.30. It closed. It was like a 40 cent range. And there's been no volume, it seems like. As a result of that, people are saying, oh yeah, like on a good year, so if I could close at $12 or on, on a good year, so if I could close at 13. Meanwhile, in December, we were like, oh yeah, so if I $20, I think I was the most bearish at 20 and you guys were like all 20 plus. By end of January, I do believe in that price target. I think that the $12 ranges are so silly. If there is some intrinsic value to a stock, there's always a range on both sides, like that sort of standard deviation between undervalued and overvalued on the stock, and, and stocks can hover in those ranges. And they should go off of some fundamental analysis. People yeah. that are saying $12 is just, you're not including the idea that, that people could be bullish on the upside of this company and a company actually reaching a much higher potential on the other side. So yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely still in that same price range. Even at the beginning of this month was like at $9. By the end of Q1 earnings, it was at $10. And so for people at that point to say $12 by the end of the year, it seems like such a conservative bet. But now, because this thing has fallen down to $750, they say, oh, yeah, $12. And so it just hovers between like plus $5, minus $5 of whatever the stock price is trading at. 
for the estimate for end of year, these things can have unpredictable moves, especially mm -hmm. when you pack in the short interest, when you pack in awareness that happens when a stock breaks out the 52 week highs, and there's a renewed sort of momentum in that stock. And you're seeing it with hood right now, it was the most hated stock on the market. It didn't matter that they had $6 billion in cash or whatever. This thing was a $7 stock. Nobody wants to touch it with a 20 foot pole. And all of a sudden at $20, they're like, should, should, should I, is it, is it a, a good time to get in? Like, is it too late? Like, should I buy more? And so this is the thing It's like sentiment follows price and that cuts both ways. And so if SoFi does go to 10, 11, 12, whatever, there could be a second win to, to push it up much higher because sentiment follows price. You have to look at what are the trends. And if SoFi can hold up what they've been doing for the last many years, then I believe we're going to see an amazing spike like that. So people are saying, even in the chat right now, $20 would seem surprising. Yeah, well, the over 5x in a firm's price in a single year, just based on linear growth, also was very surprising. Things go undervalued and things go overvalued. Don't forget, this thing has been flat for like three years, basically, like range bound in that $3 spread. This thing has been in the mid 20s before when it had much poorer financials. It's formed a very solid base of accumulation. Everybody, I mean, across the board, bearish, neutral, or bullish would tend to agree that we're towards the lower end of the range for SoFi rather than the higher end of the range. Other than Gary Gordon, there's not a lot of people who would say that it's overvalued right now. Most people would say it's undervalued. But I did a, a kind of a thought experiment, flipping the stock on the head. So we, we've seen the execution that SoFi has done. And so I was like, well, what if there's a stock that was a polar opposite? And so you know, it's a stock that instead of being down 25% of the year was up 25% of the year, yet they had a long uh, period of gap profitability, then, then they actually became unprofitable, and then they guided to be unprofitable all year. Uh, the EBITDA is declining by 30% in 2024, subscriber or customer count down 44%. They, they're going from multiple vectors of income to one, and even in that one, they're only growing 5%, they're, uh, and they're shrinking rapidly in the others. The CEO has sold the stock a number of times. The guidance uh, has always been really aggressive, and they almost always miss it with the exception of this last quarter. It's basically the opposite of SoFi. If you look at this, that kind of stock sounds like an amazing shorting opportunity. It really does. Like you would need to know more information. You wouldn't go just based off of this. And so I asked people to identify it and let me know like what they might do with it. But it was all over the place. And it was really hard to identify just based on that information. But it's ethos, the opposite of SoFi. And I think the narrative is that SoFi is many of these things when in fact it is the polar opposite. And so myself, if I saw an ethos that was like this, that was so terrible, I would be very tempted to buy naked puts and just be like, hey, I think these are going to print. There's no reason the stock should be up 25%. It makes no sense in this kind of environment, even in the middle of a bull market. So as strong as I feel about that, it's like it, the opposite is also true, that SoFi is fundamentally strong. It's not perfect. There is always a risk for downside. And I'm like, hey, it's it's a buy. Uh, I'm going to keep buying it. Um, so it can be helpful to do that uh, sort of exercise just to kind of break out of the narrative and use a, a, a metaphor analogy like this just to remove your biases from the equation, you know, removing SoFi name from the entire equation and just say, hey, what do you think about this company? But it takes time too. like just people you know, naturally are pessimistic. I saw a lot. Did you guys see a lot of capitulation or people mentioning that they were capitulating your feeds this week? I, I just feel like the longer that this goes, the more aggressive people become and the more they dig their heels into whatever respective camp they're in. This is the same thing that happens every single time. People, whenever things get bad, they say, oh my God, I'm selling. And then whenever things get super hot, they go, oh, I, I, cannot believe that I bought so much whenever it was so low and, or I didn't buy enough and these sorts of things. It's, it's at uh, market cycle psychology. It's, it, it's exactly the same. It is for every single stock. Um, some more so than others, you know, some just keep going up and that's it. Um, but that's not normal. Like even the best stocks will have times where it's pressed way down below where it should be. It's not wrong to sell just because, you know, you're feeling like you should sell just, you know, um, it, like if you're not being able to sleep at night, you have too much tied up in SoFi, um, it's causing you health issues, mental health issues, whatever, that might be a perfectly valid and good reason to sell, honestly. Yeah. Uh, or you might look at SoFi and be, and be like, you know, I, I never thought about the downsides. There's downsides to every single stock. Uh, I think Gary Gordon, I don't know if that's a real one in there. He pointed out with some, uh, I think he's wrong uh, on 
most of them, uh, but there are some things that he points out that are legitimate arguments. And so you need to weigh both sides, weigh both cases. I can be feeling a certain way towards a stock. I can't make decisions based on feelings ever. I'm not loving SoFi being down in the dumps. I don't love seeing a, a down 25% when we're at all-time high after all-time high. It's frustrating. I look at the company. I see the same things that I've done. And I so I know up here, like, hey, this is a screaming buy. And so I keep buying it heavily, even more so than, than Tesla, which I've, I've been glad to buy that position and fill that out as well. On Wednesday, NASDAQ updated their numbers per March 15th filing. Short interest for SoFi is... 209 million shares sold short, an increase from the 154 million in the beginning of March, all-time record for short interest for SoFi. Fintel reported this was 23% of short. It might actually be slightly lower because of the new shares that were issued and the float is essentially higher, still a staggering amount. For reference, in January at the beginning of the year, so the January 12th filing, the short interest was about 118 million shares. So basically, short interest has increased 77% roughly year to date. What has happened from then until now? We reported the first quarter of profitability. People are going to place bets. I'm going to do my own research and I'm holding strong. I cannot wait to see Q1. I think the thing that's going to kill shorts is if earnings expectations continue to get revised to the upside. If SoFi comes out and say, hey, well, revenue by end of year is going to be slightly higher than we expected. EPS is going to be slightly higher. EBITDA is going to be slightly higher than we expected. That's going to have to have all the analysts reprice what they think SoFi is going to do by end of year. My expectation is that that happens at least three or four times throughout the year. That is how, in my opinion, we get to that $20 price. Historically speaking, Analysts have blown me away by their expectations, continuing to hold or bet against Anthony Noto, regardless of multiple, multiple times of, of outperforming. That story can't go on forever. At some point, the fundamentals do matter. You know, narrative always matters. That narrative can switch at a time. We've seen it again and again in the last year. It is very odd for a mid cap that is profitable and is not burning money, uh, that is accelerating in growth. Uh, to be shorted in uh, at twenty percent or higher, it's very unusual. It wouldn't shock me if you know we only see that data. It's a lagging indicator. If there's been some covering since then, maybe not much, just because we see where the price is. I keep thinking that I'm like, yeah, I probably won't go up too much higher. Hey, maybe we'll see twenty five percent next month. If they want to send this stock down to like five dollars, four dollars, three dollars, the if nothing is fundamentally changed in the company, there's been a few shifts. You know, the dilution was a thing. Uh, we don't want to ignore that. But if nothing is fundamentally changed, the lower the price, the better the deal you have if you're buying that. It's frustrating if you're holding it and you can't buy the dip. I get that. What we know for sure is we know that the management team is incentivized to get the stock to a certain value by mid-2026. There's nothing that's set in stone that says that they have to get the stock by that range in 2024 or in 2025. A lot of the counterpoints that I've been seeing. Obviously, dilution is a, is a big one. I saw this one post where they basically said, hey, well, in order for institutional ownership to go up, they have to buy from retail. They're incentivized to buy from retail lower. We have talked about this manipulation in the past in the short term. I mean, Anthony Noto mentioned it on Kramer himself. Investors are shorting the stock as a form of delta hedging for the convertible notes. There's a lot that goes on in the short term that manipulates the stock price that has nothing to do with the actual underlying fundamental of the company that detaches those two things over the course of, let's say, this year. I could totally see a year where we could have 2024 come to an end and so if I could still be at uh, the under $10 range, regardless of having four quarters of profitability, I guess then it just becomes a conversation of how much do we put on uh, retail investors to single-handedly drive the stock price up while all the institutions are shorting it down, trying to suppress the stock price, maybe accumulate in the background or whatever that may be. Like my point that I'm trying to make is there could full on be an explosion of this stock upwards, but we're not guaranteed that that's going to happen in 2024 at all. You know, we could have cores of profitability. I think that's the main argument that we're all hinging on right now is to say, well, if they beat analyst expectations, then they should go up in a one dimensional argument. They should. But when you add all of these other layers of incentives, 
from an institutional perspective, hedge funds, whatever, it becomes a much more complex equation. We're looking at the stock predominantly, I would say 80 or 90% of our conversation focuses on the underlying fundamental business execution. But what has SoFi proven to us so far that that single layer of the business executing does not translate to the stock price going up in the short term. And yeah, I mean, I think we can all agree in the you know next two years or next three years, that the stock price will eventually close that gap, but we're not guaranteed for that to happen this year. It's important to understand, I think, that a lot of the people that are making shorts are not just necessarily betting against SoFi in particular. Whenever this is uh, makes up a large percentage of your portfolio, people are saying, hey, why SoFi go up? Why SoFi go down? Rather than, hey, why are interest rate sensitive stocks going up? Why are interest rate sensitive stocks going down? Sometimes we zoom in so close that we're looking at SoFi trying to navigate the waters and, and they're doing great things, but the tides are shifting in their favor or away from their favor. Those sorts of things I don't think are given enough credit. I think the important thing that people need to realize is that why are you holding this company? What are you holding it for? Is it to make a three-month gain or is it to make a multi-year gain? Everyone keeps asking me. They, they ask me like every multiple months. They go, hey, Tanner, you need to update your, your price target for 2020 or 2030 for SoFi. It's like, I don't think you understand the point of that video. It's a 2030 price target. We'll see if I'm right. The, the short-term bumps is not what people get right. The way I sort of projected it was in a linear scope, but that doesn't mean that what happens in between those two points is going to be linear. And you can see massive lows and massive highs, and there's going to be lots of fluctuation. Stop talking about SoFi having a short squeeze. The shorts are winning. Well, what the hell does that even mean? At what point do they win? If, the, if we get 90 plus percent short interest and the stock goes down to $2 a share, do they win? Or do I just buy more shares? I, there's no winning here for shorts. And the longer that they wait for seven to go down to six or five, it's costing them money to do so. So let them make their bets. Some people get a little bit crazy about the manipulation stuff and want to fight back and you're spending your own dollars to do so. If you're a long-term investor, I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> like, it's, it's whenever the company actually deteriorates. And maybe that's why I respect some of the comments about Gary is because he's not talking about the stock price. He's talking about how he thinks the company is going to deteriorate. I, I did an article at the beginning of this week, I believe it was, uh, or it might have been the tail end of last week, on whether SoFi was actually a squeeze play. It is uh, any stock that's uh, that is shorted this much, but that's not why I'm ultimately in SoFi. I just view of it at ultimately as a free call option, a call option that I don't have to pay for, that can absolutely print, even though I didn't have to do anything but buy shares. And if someone wants to borrow them, so be it. They're still mine. If we subscribe to that Warren Buffett idea of like, hey, you're going to buy a farm, you're not going to check on the price of the you know farm every day. You're just going to sit tight and ride that out. But we don't live in that vacuum. It's compared to all the other opportunity costs in the market that you could have invested in. And as a result, that's the introduction to the emotional aspect of it. You either yeah. get ridiculed for holding SoFi when I could have been all in on Palantir. And then Palantir, you get ridiculed because you could have been on all in on NVIDIA. And then NVIDIA, you get ridiculed because you could have been all in on Bitcoin. It's like, dude, when does it end? Well, I, I don't think anyone gets ridiculed for their stock yeah, picks no, other than the people who like, Whoever is the most successful with their returns, people view them as smarter than or that they had some type of alpha or wow, like they're so successful because they see this like time frame, but it's never ending because there's so many different alternatives. Number one. Number two, all of those disagreements with, let's say, one stock particularly, let's take SoFi. All of those disagreements, in my opinion, are disagreements on time frame. Shorts can win, yes and longs can win. It's just a matter of time frame. You know, um, yep. somebody who's making the trade can win. Somebody who's doing a long-term investment can win. And so for me to disagree with, I don't know, somebody in the chat that says, SoFi is not going to go to 20 or whatever. It's just a matter of time frame. Like, yeah, it might not go to my price target next year, but it might go there in my time horizon that I'm looking at it because I'm investing for the long term and they might be trading it. And so where they're frustrated, I'm excited because there's an opportunity for me to keep accumulating. And those discrepancies happen all the time. It is kind of annoying that that's where the sort of conversation has led to, though. It's just like price action and how to stomach it. Pick the time frame in which you're going to be investing in and then have some freaking stomach, not brains, just stomach. <laughs> Revisit why you got into the stock. Like if it, if you were following someone else in the trade and you didn't do the homework, learn from that. That's on you. Don't do that uh, because stocks, when they go down like this, 
you don't have the the conviction. You haven't actually done anything. You don't know if the person that was saying, hey, it's going to do this, or I like this uh, stock for this reason is right. But if you've actually put in some time and you put in some uh, money in a position, like we're not talking about like you put in a hundred bucks in Dogecoin, like whatever. Uh, but if you put some some of your hard earned cash, a considerable chunk of it on a stock, you owe it to yourself to do your own due diligence, not just listen to us, uh, you know, do pull up those earnings calls, uh, listen to those, look back into the earnings reports, see what other people are, are saying and make sure that it's right. And then that allows you to build that stomach so that if it goes down, you're like, okay, nothing has changed in my, my thesis, my narrative. And so this is actually a deal. And you know that versus, you know, and the other way too, like if SoFi ran up, we talked about this as a possibility at the end of December, that if SoFi was bought out or if it ran up to like 20, I don't know what price we put it, but like 25 bucks, 35, 30 bucks, all of us would have been out at that point, like in January, just like someone wants us to give, give, give us 30 bucks in SoFi. We think that's an amazing company that long-term it will be above 30 bucks. Realistically at that point, it's like, man, I, I'd probably hold on to just a little bit out, out of sentiment, like hundred shares, but the rest of it is like, okay, there's so many opportunities in this market and ways to make money. I still would, if, if we squeezed and we're popping up to 30 bucks, the way that I view it, this is a real time case study in how to handle that volatility, because a lot of the people that are watching right now might be younger investors that just entered their first bull market, or maybe they entered during the downturn. I think you learn way more about how you handle your risk tolerance, how you handle your stomach, how you handle your volatility for a stock that's been flat for two years. And how is your reaction to that? Are you truly long term? Can you put that to the test rather than if I entered the market for the first time ever and I just threw a dart at a dartboard and it happened to land on NVIDIA and this thing goes up 10x and oh my gosh, this investing thing is so easy. Everybody else is an idiot for not doing this. Everybody is going to learn that lesson sooner or later that not everything goes up all the time forever. SoFi is one of the companies where we've drilled as many holes as we can on the actual fundamentals of the business. And now it's just a waiting game for the stock price to catch up to what the fundamentals are for that valuation, right? Having these conversations about dealing with the emotions throughout that wave, the stock doesn't owe it to you to be up, man. Tesla was flat for like 10 years and look how it worked out for those investors. A lot of them made life-changing money. What about if they had sold during that time? If they couldn't stomach that volatility, if they couldn't stomach the fact that there's opportunity costs in the market and everything else is going up and your stock is not going up. And so everybody's running their own race. And I think it's important to have that conversation because it provides a perspective that not a lot of people will see if it's their first bull market that they're ever coming into. I think Tesla is the best example, at least that I've lived through, where that stock was, one, the heaviest shorted stock on the stock market before 2020, had plateaued in price around the $50 billion market cap uh, range for quite a long time. And then as it started to shoot up, you could see these uh, moments where people were having heavy sell-offs and people were jumping out of or jumping out of the ship because they were going, oh, it's headed back down to a band that it was in before. I don't think that it's healthy to find stocks, be in them for 18 months and jump ship and then find another company. It's like, I just don't believe that investors are that good to continuously find new investments over and over and over that, that win. If you look at some of the best investors in the world, what they usually say is that, hey, we don't have great track records for picking stocks. Whenever we land them, we don't sell them. And that has led to some of the best outperformance because they are compounding. Real compounding comes from holding. And I think the problem that people are going to get in because of the way that SoFi has acted is that if it does go up to 12, you're going to see people take profit. And and perfectly good. I hope that people are comfortable with that amount of gain, but I'm not. That would be a loss in my opinion because it wouldn't have outperformed the S&P 500. So can we talk about these executives leaving for just a couple of minutes? The news that broke on Tuesday morning in the form of an 8K was that the SoFi Bank president, Chad Borton, who had been with the company since the start of SoFi Bank when they purchased Golden Pacific Bank Corp in 2021, he just announced his resignation effective April 12th. This comes just two weeks after Aaron Webster. For Webster, he was replaced as the chief risk officer, essentially demoted a month later. 
Alex Chris was posting saying that he joined PayPal. I think we all couldn't justify that move. Uh, just being in, you know, an office job ourselves, if we were demoted in our job, like obviously we'd look for something else. Two weeks later, then you have the SoFi Bank president. He's going to be succeeded by the VP who's going to move up to that role. Let me present the positive and the negative. The negative case is to say you have two major executives who are leaving within two weeks of each other. Like what is going on on this leadership team? Are we losing confidence here? Because I think the thing that I mentioned in my video was that as more of these key executives leave, the execution risk increases. Like if Anthony Noto left, for example, the SoFi bull case would really be at risk. If Elon left Tesla, the bull case would really be at risk, so on and so forth, because these are the people that you're essentially betting on. Now, I'm not saying Chad Borden is one of those people, but he did, had success with SoFi Bank. The other side of it is people leave companies all the time, and it's not really going to be that big of a deal. You have to keep in mind as well that the timing is not some conspiracy theory or power struggle at the very highest level. It's just when the RSUs vested, People are waiting for their stocks to vest, and then they leave after that. It was my understanding that Chad Borden had came out of retirement to be in this role for SoFi. You know, going through the bank licensing process in the hardest of times, the original candidate was actually the vice president for yeah. this role. That is now actually taking the primary presidential role for the for SoFi Bank. So in my understanding, this is exactly probably what they had planned behind closed doors. He'll stay here until his options vest. He'll get the bank up and running with all his expertise and get shadowed by this person who is going to take over next. We're watching that unfold. And it's just happening in the same sort of similar week as Aaron Webster. And so people are pointing fingers going, oh my God, is the whole C-suite jumping ship? And it's like, yes, I believe that people are making bets on the full C-suite. Oh, really? I'd be scared if Chris Lapointe left or if Noto left. Everyone right. else, oh, yeah. I'm not too worried. Yeah. And I think Borton, I mean, he's pretty impressive. But I, I agree with you. I think that, that, you know, what you pointed out, that this is always a plan. I would also be a little cautious. I want to throw Derek White out there. Uh, I think he's done a phenomenal job with Galileo. Miguel Santos, uh, perhaps as well from Technosis. Um, I think that those are key guys. So Borton leaving is not bullish. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to say that. Marin Webster, it's harder to get a read on him, but the bank has done very well. So it's not amazing, but I think that he's was here for a, a finite season. He's done what he needed to do, and he was ready to hand over the reins. Don't know that for sure. So two things on that. Uh, Chad Borton was also an Army Ranger. Noto and him are friends. He brought him in to get things up to speed. So if we subscribe to this idea that Borton came out of retirement specifically to help SoFi get the bank up and running, and it's totally a plausible case, I think, when they were doing the due diligence after the fact when Borton left, they were looking at his offer letter and the actual uh, clauses in his offer letter and how that's different from uh, somebody like Noto or LaPointe or whatever in terms of the exit clauses and, and just trying to gauge from that whether it was temporary, like whether the language was there. He left retirement to set up SoFi Bank and now he's leaving SoFi Bank. The underlying assumption is that SoFi Bank is set up. It's at a place where it's self-sustaining now. It can run like all of the setup hardship is over and it can be, you know, it doesn't need Chad Borton anymore. He's fulfilled his duty to set that up. So that's one point. The second point is just the, the main thing that I was worried about was the language in the 8K, which basically said that he's looking to pursue other opportunities. Because if this was somebody that came out of retirement and news comes out next week or two weeks from now that, you know, he went to, I don't know, PayPal, let's say, or, or whatever else, that wouldn't obviously be a great look, or that could have been just boilerplate language that was put there and doesn't mean anything. And he's actually just going to go back into retirement. I mean, that's um, that's kind of the nature of, of this. It's We're not living in, in the 1950s or 60s where guys would start up things and then just stick with it the rest of their life or, or come in and work for 40 years. A lot of these high-performing executives are there for like five years, six years, 10 years, maybe. Uh, but that's kind of stretching it. And Borton, you know, if you look at his... Impeccable resume, it's the same thing. It just, it's how it's done. And rarely, unless you are the founder, and even in those cases, sometimes does it deviate from that. So even if he got a job elsewhere, he may have just had that finite role. And they said, hey, we think that we're ready to hold, hand off the reins. And it could have been a situation where they said, if you're looking for another job, you know, we'll just keep moving out the date. But when you find something, you know, we'll announce your resignation because um, you've done a, an impeccable job. And, and he has. And, but that that is boilerplate language. Uh, pursue other opportunities. I've seen that 
from somebody getting a different job to them being fired uh, to retirement. It's just, it's like the most vanilla of reasons that somebody can leave. So I wouldn't read too much in that. What's SoFi's excuse for Robinhood having a better credit card option? What's the entire industry's excuse? Every single bank and every single credit issuer for Robinhood having a better card than them. SoFi's credit card, they could be offering 0% cash back or 10% cash back. Regardless, their default rates are so high that it's not even remotely a profitable product for them. This idea that Robinhood has made this product that is going to excel is not something that we know yet. And as a consumer, I think that it's a perfect product. But as an institution, we truly don't know the answer. 3% cash back is unruly high that is not offered by many. Like for example, PayPal offers it, but only if you end up choosing their PayPal checkout options because they make money on the checkout side and they also make money on the interchange side from the card, which makes it high enough for it to be profitable. I sure hope that they have their numbers right in terms of the customers that they're bringing on, the FICOs that they're not asking for, but it is too early to tell. There's been lots of revolutionary products that have come out in, in the lines of credit that have just ended up not working. Yes, they hope to make some money off of it, but they would really like to grow their gold subscriptions, which it absolutely will, monthly active users and, and just users in general on the Robinhood platform, which it absolutely will. The question is, what is the price of that? They have not quite 7 billion in cash. If it ends up costing them because of charge-offs, three billion of that, a couple of years, not worth it. Like it's terrible. Uh, they'd have to bring on a lot of people. My main concern with it is not the three percent. I think that they can afford that. The interchange rates, they benefit from that. Only one of the the rewards really hurts Robinhood. You know, Vlad mentioned he's trying to get uh, revenue from the gold, which looks like it's going to raise from five to six ninety nine. There's not been a formal announcement, but you see that in the terms and agreements, a few people see that as well. So it's kind of like paying an annual fee. You just get a lot more with the Robinhood gold. They're trying to make some money off the lending too. Now, average rates for credit cards, 23.5%, quite high in the United States. The variable rate for Robinhood is up to 29.99%. Maybe it's a slightly higher than that. Not everybody pays off their balance in full. They'll be making money off of that. The, the big question is, will they be making more money off the interest than the write-offs and the charge-offs? I don't know. It was funny, whenever they did the presentation, the guy, he said he made $150,000 and then they instantly approved him and gave him $20,000 of credit limit. That's not the Capital One way or the New Bank way or where that sort of style is from. So yeah, and, and Vlad had mentioned, but they would like to see almost every gold member be able to qualify for this card. Now, we don't know what that means. That might mean that some people that have like very sketchy credit, and they're able to see, of course, what they have on Robinhood. They're able to see the income. It's not just like, hey, we're going to give everybody $20,000. They might give somebody that's a little riskier, like a thousand bucks. If they give like 90% of people $20,000 limit uh, within seconds, I have concerns as a shareholder. There is some risk. I think it's a mistake to ignore that completely because they could be losing money on this. And if they do, you know, that's not even necessarily bearish for Robinhood. It just depends how many of those actually convert uh, to the Robinhood trading platform who are using Robinhood Gold. They do have an escape clause like most companies do of this nature in their rewards program. It's either 45 days or 60 days that they can notify people and say, hey, we are uh, changing our terms. So some have postulated that that's what's happening, that they're using this as a hook to get people initially. And then they will change the terms and, and make it so that it's instead of 3%, like 3% in these categories, but it's 2% in most. Robinhood has been having a hard time breaking profitability. Why do we think that no other company has come out, has offered 5% APY, 3% cash back, 1% deposit, 3% on IRAs? It's freaking expensive. They're starting to break profitability again, but lowest rates for buying stocks, almost the lowest rate for buying options, uh, one of the lowest rates for buying crypto. Though. Your margin is paper thin. Now you start playing with credit. Credit can fluctuate in terms of its default rates. It's not guaranteed to me that Robinhood walks out of here being the winner. I can guarantee you guys that you guys walk out being the winners as consumers. I would switch over everything in a heartbeat to have those types of rates. Everything. They give you that 1% but it's over 24 installments, one for each month. It's not compounding on itself. The cost That's of acquisition- fine. It doesn't make it less expensive. They, they yield 1% on their um, on their cash sweeps. They'll make double the cost over two years from the cash Yeah, but, but then that's perfectly fine. But you were making that rate with or without that bonus. So you've cut your margin. You've cut your margin, yes. Lower margins, 
but higher volume. Think that Vlad realizes that this is really the time to go for it. Really, really good. Like everything's lining up almost perfectly for Robin Hood. There's risk longer term, but on this time he's, he's realizing we can still make money acquiring customers. I don't know if that's true with the credit card, but with the 1% for sure it is. And yeah, after two years, will some like Chamath with the $5 billion leave and go elsewhere? Sure, he for sure will. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of people who look at Robin and say, you know, what? I've, I've tried it. I've sampled the goods. I don't want to go back to whoever they're using, Thinkorswim, you know, the great options. There's a million ways that this can go right. There's a million ways that this can go wrong. We don't have any numbers. All we have is what the announcement is. Either they invite everybody and their mother and they lose money on it or they just have a huge influx and by all indications early indications they're having a huge influx of an unbelievable uh, influx insane amount i think it sounds I'm, like more people have signed up for this in the last week than anyone has signed up for sofi's credit card hundreds of thousands of signups and that's great. Either they're going to lose money on these people or they're going to make money somehow on these people because if they're not going to be scrutinous around the FICOs and around the ability to repay, the chances are that they're going to lose more money, right? Like just logically speaking, if they do make money on these people by having the brokerage side of the business cover the cost, by having it as a loss leader, by, you know, whatever the method may be, Robinhood finds a way to offer 3% and, and you know, 1% unlimited a deposit and all of these amazing benefits and they can do it profitably and they don't have to set like rigorous credit limits. Fidelity is going to jump right on that. Sofa is going to jump right on that. All of these people are going to jump right on that to figure out, okay, how did they make money on this? Oh, cool. Let's just copy paste, do the same thing. And as a result of that, from a benefits perspective, it's going to reach parity over the next six months to a year because Robinhood will have validated that that model is viable. I don't think SoFi should chase this. They should see how it plays out. If it works well for Robinhood, absolutely emulate that. They have a... Let's not forget what Anthony Noto said on the Kathy Wood thing. Stay oh, in man. your lane. Yes. He's not Do chasing. It. No, he, he yes, yeah, stay in your lane. So I was like a direct thing at Robinhood. You, you heard the challenge uh, as well that, that the Visa CEO mentioned in context that sounded very SoFi-esque. One-stop shop. That's what he called Robinhood. There's a little beef here. I kind of like it, even though I'm shareholders of both. We'll have to see how it plays out. But I, I, I don't mind SoFi sitting on the sidelines and just saying, hey, we're not going to necessarily chase this. Like if they offered 3% with the trouble they've had with the charge-offs, that would be terrible, actually. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>